Good afternoon, everyone. How was lunch? Awesome, awesome. Uh, my name is Andrea Locke. I'm a patient navigator at the Cordoma Foundation. I am sure I have been in contact with some of you, if not all of you, at some point, either through email or over the phone. And I just want to uh, thank you all for being here um, today and welcome you to our afternoon breakout sessions. Um, this current session is gonna be focusing on managing side effects for uh, clival and upper cervical patients. Um, we'll, we'll hear uh, uh, presentations from two uh, specialists, Dr. Lisa Natchigal and Dr. Dean Sestari. Um, Dr. Natchigal is the director of the Neuroendocrine Clinical Center at Mass General Hospital and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Her primary clinical focus is in uh, pituitary disorders, and today she'll be speaking about uh, hormonal deficiency, some of which there are questions about during the Ask the Experts panel earlier today, so she'll be able to um, dive a little bit more into that. And um, Dr. Sestari is a clinical scientist who provides medical treatment for neuro-ophthalmolic disorders. So today he will be talking about some of the co common vision issues that um, clavicle chordoma patients face, such as um, cross-eyed, double vision, things like that, and some of the ways in which they can be managed. After they give their presentations, we'll open up the floor for questions um, from you guys directly for the doctors, and then we'll proceed with the afternoon from there. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Nachigal. Hello and good morning. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for joining us on a nice Saturday in Boston. It shows how devoted you are to your health care or somebody with Cordoma that you care for to be here on a Saturday. I appreciate that. And I am an endocrinologist, and so we actually see some Cordoma patients who have had brain area tumors that end up with endocrine problems but can be missed if you're not dealing with an endocrinologist focused on the pituitary. And so that's what I am. And so I'll share a little bit of background. And then um, my colleague, Dr. Sestari, will share the information about visual problems that can be associated with this treatment. And in reality, in real life world, we actually work hand in hand in seeing these patients, although we never see each other physically. And this is the first time, I think, in maybe five years or something that we have seen each other physically. Because at Mass General, everything is electronic. So there we go. Thanks for getting us in the same room. So I think you probably know this better than I do if you've had a chordoma. And I'll take a moment to just ask who, if you don't mind saying, who has a chordoma in this room? And who is here because someone they take care of or they're a partner of somebody with a chordoma? So about half and half. And who is here because they care for chordoma patients in another professional fashion? Okay. Um, so, and who is here with a cranial or upper cervical chordoma? And who has a chordoma somewhere else, outside of the skull? Okay. So this talk is really for people that have had cervical or brain area chordomas, not the ones down in the spine, which would not be relevant for this talk. So feel free to leave if you're one of those people. So uh, just to start with, see if I can get a pointer to work. There we go. So this is, this is where your brain sits. And this little tiny thing right here is where the pituitary sits. It's a very small, powerful gland that controls every hormone in your body. And right below it is the clivus bone. A very hard, like if you ask somebody, like if you say, I have a tumor in my clivus, I think Half the people, maybe more than half, the very educated people in the world would be like, what is the clivus, right? Um, so it's a little hidden bone right here, and that's where many of these tumors arise. Raise your hand if your tumor arised in the clivus area from that bone. Yeah, raise your hand if you've ever seen a picture or had any understanding of where that bone was. Okay, some of you have. Raise your, raise your hand if you had a clival tumor, but this is the first time you've seen the bone. A few people, okay. So I'm going to give you an example of one of my patients, actually a current patient that I care for at Mass General, who 
has no, we will not identify her name to keep it private, but she is still going through some of the hormone complications that we are now making progress with. And I thought her journey may have relevance to you and may set kind of a vignette for us to follow through and then address your questions from a similar kind of sequence of events that you may have experienced. So this is a 67-year-old woman who presented with weakness in her right arm, imbalance. She had left facial pain, numbness around her mouth. Later, so she had that for a while, months before she came to attention. And then she developed some difficulty swallowing. Eventually, with this constellation of symptoms, particularly increasing weakness in her right leg, she ended up in the hospital. And then she had an MRI because neurology saw her. And that MRI shows you this. It's actually hard to find these. Uh, even on the MRIs, like I'm used to looking at the pituitary, which is right here. And it's a little bit like lower down and posterior. So this is her tumor. It was about 3.5 centimeters, pretty large. Here's another view as you walk, walk backward through the brain to kind of the little circular thing here, which is posterior, meaning behind it. It's all one. So you kind of get different views, and you get a, a more a sense of like where it is, very helpful for the surgeon to know how, how they can debulk that. And so they knew from these scans pretty, pretty right away that it was, in fact, a chordoma. They weren't 100% sure. They thought it might be a meningioma. And you never really know the path of what it is, because there's a lot of things that sit in this area of your skull. Um, just to go back for a second, chordomas are one of the many, many, many different neoplastic means like tumors. They're not, they can be benign tumors, luckily. Um, there are many of them. And the chordoma is one of them that sits in that spot. There also can be many other things there, from infection to cysts to hemorrhage, congenital problems. So when you have an MRI originally, there's a question of what is it, right? That's, that's a big obstacle, and surgery is going to give you the answer. If you didn't have surgery, you don't know for sure what you have. Once you have surgery, you get path, and the path will say, OK, this is a chordoma, and then you will know. This patient underwent an endoscopic endonasal surgery. And this was done, and it's really important that you all have the very best surgeons to do this, because it's such a tricky area with so many structures around the brain that you don't want to dig into. So this was like a person that's one of the best in the world that does these. And he did the best debulking he could without hurting her. And that worked out pretty well, but she did have complications. These are tough tumors. They are tough surgeries, even in the hands of the best people. She had a, a lung clot, which is pulmonary embolus. She also had hyponatremia. That brought her back into the hospital. We get involved there when there's sodium abnormalities. And then she had to go back and have another debulking, and then eventually radiation. And just to kind of take that all in, she had a lot of problems that she was suffering from for a long time. She gets the diagnosis, two surgeries, major surgeries, some complications, and irradiation. Raise your hand if that sounds familiar. A couple of people have had like a similar kind of route. And so there are so many doctors that, that very, very, very specific specialists, right, that need to be involved to do this well. This is not someone that you can't go to your primary care and say, hey, I have a chordoma. Like, tell me what to do next, right? They will not even know where the clivus is, probably. Um, and so you want a really skilled neurosurgeon, not just a regular neurosurgeon, but a skull-based neurosurgeon. Neurologists or neuro-oncologists need to be involved because when there's invasion into the other brain structures or the cranial nerves, those are the people you want help from. Neuro-ophthalmologists, thank God we have Dean Sestari because he and his group are experts in this area, and they know exactly what to do, and we know we can rely on them to know the right uh, ophthalmology exam that he'll tell you about. And so we work you know, always like, what are your visual fields? What does the ophthalmology say? And we'll, we'll have a back and forth that way. He'll send them back to us if he thinks the tumor may be in infiltrating the pituitary, that kind of thing. 
So, so these doctors have to work together. And if you have a center that doesn't work well together, that is going to influence your care in a negative fashion. If you have a well, kind of good, integrated, interdisciplinary center where they're focused on kind of pituitary care and chordoma treatment, this is a big advantage for you as a patient. The radiation oncologist is one of the key people in the lives of somebody with a chordoma. Most people will have radiation. Raise your hand if you had radiation. Raise your hand if you have a chordoma and you didn't have radiation. OK. Um, the ENT people can be involved, either in the surgeries or some of the complications. And then what, this is what I am. They're sometimes not in the picture, but anyone who's had radiation, they should be in the picture. Because after radiation, you can get hormone loss months later or years later. It could be 10 years later. You always need an annual neuroendocrine evaluation for hormone loss. Because all those things, everything else is so hard, the endocrine is icing on the cake. It's super easy. If you're missing a hormone, we give it back. So when you think somebody might have hypopituitarism, because I showed you that little gland up there right next to where the clivus is, if that gets affected by the radiation, you can lose hormones. And there's a general principle that we have in the endocrinology. If you think you may be insufficient or not making enough hormone, sometimes just getting a level is not enough. We try to stimulate it and see what happens when we max it out. Those are some of our stimulation tests. And then we measure, or we measure it at a time when it should normally be high. For example, cortisol. You can't just get a cortisol at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to be low in everybody, normally. But if you think it's low, you can do a stimulation test. You can do a cortrosin stimulation test. Or you can measure it in the morning when it should be high. So the causes of hypopituitarism in patients with clival chordomas could be that the tumor that was originally there is affecting your pituitary function, or that the radiation later on is affecting your pituitary function. That's an important one because that one, once you have the radiation, even if you get evaluated a year later and everything is perfect with your pituitary, you still need ongoing checks. After the surgery, you can also lose some hormones. But once you get your follow-up surgery evaluation at six weeks and your hormones are fine, that will not change. Like the surgical part and the complication on the pituitary from the surgery is done by a couple of months in most cases. So once you've been, if you just had surgery and you don't have a pituitary problem and your tumor doesn't grow, you're probably good from a pituitary point of view. So what would you look for if you did have, or, or what probably your endocrinologist did if you have an endocrinologist, is we think about all the pituitary hormones, all the anterior pituitary hormones. There's growth hormone. There's adrenal, there are gonadal, which is testosterone and estrogen, and there's thyroid. And the growth hormone one in an adult is probably not the most relevant because you don't have to have growth hormone once you've grown. We do need it if you're a child and you have a chordoma as a child, and then you have radiation. You will need growth hormone if you haven't finished growing. But if you finish growing, you, you probably will not want growth hormone just because sometimes tumors can be stimulated by growth hormone. But in rare cases, after you know, a lot of years of remission, it would be possible to go on it. Uh, adrenal hormone is really important because if you're missing it, it can be kind of life or death if you're in a stressful situation. And you do that measurement, just as I said, by either a morning cortisol or a cortrosin stimulation test. Gonadal function, if you're in reproductive age women, you don't get your periods, that should definitely be checked. If you have periods, it doesn't have to be checked if they're regular because that's better than a blood test. Thyroid is very tricky because most doctors, internists, if they want to check your thyroid, do you know what test they would do? PSA. Correct. Is that the right test or a sufficient test to do to evaluate somebody with a chordoma who's had radiation? So you already know more than most internists because you answered correctly. And you probably honestly do. And it's not that the internists are stupid. They're very smart and they're very busy and they take care of a lot of patients that have hypothyroidism from a thyroid problem. And they know the right test to do for that. And they know how to look at that TSH level and tell you if it's normal or not. And that's important for 99.9% .9 of their patients. But when it comes to you, if you've had a chordoma, that is not the right test. And they will miss hypothyroidism. And you might have sluggishness and memory dysfunction because your TSH is normal, but your free T4 is low. So the free T4 is the measurement you want if you have anything wrong with your pituitary or that area. 
So um, this patient's hormone tests were obtained at six months and 12 months after radiation. That's our protocol. We do it six, 12, 24, and then ongoing every year. She did everything, it was normal. And then she wasn't due again until 24 months. So it was like she was cleared, I told her you're good, your hormones are fine. And then she goes to her internist at 17 months after radiation and she feels terrible. She has like swelling of her legs, she's really, really weak, it's a big mystery what's going on, she's exhausted, feels horrible. And they do a court stimul test for me because I wasn't supposed to have a visit with her and it turns out it's super low. So she developed adrenal insufficiency with profound symptoms in between the testing interval that we, use, that we usually do and suffered a lot in that process but was very quickly helped when she found that out. Interestingly, the internist that saw her was wonderful and did a lot of this but did a TSH that was normal. And it was only later when she got in to see me that we realized that her free T4 was very low. And so now she's, of course, treated with both things doing way better. So I'm gonna just uh, show you quickly the instructions for adrenal insufficiency that we give to patients because I think of everything I said, this is the, this is the slide that could be potentially most useful or life-saving if you have adrenal insufficiency. Raise your hand if you have adrenal insufficiency, if you don't mind. Is there only one person with adrenal insufficiency? Only one person willing to admit adrenal insufficiency. My guess is that many of you may be underdiagnosed adrenal insufficiency because if that many people had radiation, 50% of people at some point are gonna get some hormone loss. But it also may be that this is a selection of people that made it here and are doing really well. Um, but anyway, for the one person in the room that has adrenal insufficiency or others that might have it or get it in the future, uh, these are the instructions. The key thing is take your, take your medicine every day, and if you're sick with a fever, double it. If you vomit, you need a shot, unless you can quickly take it right after you vomit and, and swallow it, and if you can't, you need an injection. You need to go to the ER for fluids and injection, or tell your doctor. And um, doubling it when you're ill is really important, so if you're on prednisone, five milligrams, go to 10. If you're on hydrocortisone, 10 and five, double that. And I think, that is, so just to summarize, um, the testing for hypopituitarism should be done prior to your therapy when you're first evaluated and then ongoing yearly after radiation. You really have to interpret it based on a clinical context of how you are. If you're super sick in the hospital, sometimes these tests are not um, reliable. Make sure that you get a free T4 as well as a TSH when your thyroid is evaluated. And there's very special stimulation tests for growth hormone and adrenal that you want to make sure have been done if you've had radiation. And um, these hormone replacement therapies, not everybody's the same. There's not like you have to be on this and everybody's on the same dose. There's, there's great to get to know an endocrinologist who knows you and what the right dose for you is. So that is the end of what I'd like to start with. And then I think Dr. Sistari is going to talk about um, visual issues, and then we'll both be able to take questions. Well, that was really great. I actually learned a lot from that. So, um, so as uh, Lisa said, um, I want to thank you for being here because I know it's uh, summertime and I know how important this topic or these topics are to you. I see a couple of my patients in the audience. And um, I'm really going to focus on diplopia or double vision um, because that is a fairly common manifestation of clivocordomas. So can I ask how many people here have experienced double vision? They are a fair number. And of the caregivers out here, do you have a good concept of what double vision is and what your loved ones are experiencing? No, so that's what I'm gonna really kind of focus on. What is double vision, how to think about it, and um, how we can help. And just by way of background, just so you know my background, I'm a neurologist and an ophthalmologist, and then I trained in neuro-ophthalmology. My family doesn't even know what the heck I do for a living, and it is confusing, and you guys have all these different doctors, but 
really, sometimes the neurologists don't really understand the visual aspects and the ophthalmologists don't understand the neurologic aspects. So as a neuro-ophthalmologist, we kind of put things together, okay, and then take care of people who have tumors in their central nervous system that are causing visual problems. And I'm also a strabismus surgeon, and I'll go through what strabismus is um, in terms of eye misalignment, and I operate on, um, well, we, we give different treatments, but one of the things I do is surgery, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So I have no financial disclosures for this talk. And like I said, um, <clears throat> really I have two goals. It's really to help the patients and their, and their loved ones understand how to think about double vision or diplopia. So double vision and diplopia, I might interchange those terms. They mean the same thing, okay, seeing two images. And we're, I'm really going to talk about how to treat it. So if you look at these images, they're really very difficult to even look at, right? But this is what... If, you, if you're experiencing double vision, what you're seeing, and if you're, if you're caring for someone and they complain of blurry vision, confusing vision, or double vision, it's really this. Um, let me see with the, oh, how do I, where's the laser, it's here, okay. So um, sometimes <clears throat> that looks like two images. Sometimes it's a blurred image, right? Because if I have two fingers, you say, oh, there's two fingers, but the closer they get, it could be like one blurred finger. So sometimes it looks like a, oh, sorry. Uh, it looks like a blurry double image, but there'll always be like a more prominent one and then kind of a shadow. My patients are always like, no, Dr. Starr, it's a shadow, it's not double, but I'm using that terminology. It's, it's kind of blurry, double, shadowy, it's all the same thing. Different people describe it differently. And it can be side by side, or it can be on top of each other, or a combination. Chordoma patients typically have it side by side. And then, um, these are old, my fellow kind of did this a number of years ago, but there's different types of double vision, okay? There's something called monocular, and then binocular. So if you have double vision and you cover one eye and you still have double vision, that's monocular, meaning it's coming from a single eye. And that's always due to an ophthalmic problem, not from a chordoma, not from a neurologic cause. So that might mean you need glasses or you have a cataract or something in the eye. Okay, and then, so that's here, monocular. And then sometimes the eye doctor will put down this little pinhole okay, and the vision will improve or the double vision will go away. And that tells the doctor that it's coming from a single eye, it's monocular, it's a general ophthalmic problem, and so it's usually gonna be due to something like, a, this is a cataract, this is something in the cornea, this is if you had an intraocular lens, it's displaced. The details don't matter, but what matters is it's, it's ophthalmic and it's not due to the chordoma. In terms of binocular, What's going on is, here, let me show you guys this. Okay, so the way we have depth perception is we have two eyes and they're separated horizontally and they're focused on the same target. So you get a slightly different perspective on that target. The images come in and the brain fuses them and that's how we have depth perception, okay? But what can happen if you have an eye that's misaligned, that second image comes into the brain in a different place and the brain cannot fuse, that's the term, or bring those separate images together. So people will see two separate images. Now we refer to this often as strabismus. This is just like a term that just means misaligned eyes. That can be from any cause. Kids are born with a lazy eye sometimes. So strabismus is the general term, strabismus surgeons fix it. So sometimes you'll be referred to a strabismus surgeon. My mother cannot pronounce this for the life of her. I've been doing this for 20 years. She's like, you're whatever, but it's strabismus, okay? Um, and then there's different types, right? So in this case, the eye can be turned towards the nose. So the person's looking straight with this eye, this eye's turned in, you have an esotropia, okay? And patients with chordomas, that's typically what they have. But the eye could be turned out from other causes, the eye could be um, pulled down, or the eye could be pushed up. And again, I'm simplifying this, of course. And then when you go into the eye doctor's office, this is what we do. We kind of, if anyone's been here and they kind of take this paddle and cover each eye, the reason we're doing this is if the straight eye sees the, the letter E, and then there's a misaligned eye, okay, and then I cover this eye, what's gonna happen? This eye moves over to see the letter, okay? And so that's the deviation that we can see, 
and then we can measure that. And based upon the measure, measurement, we can tell the, the angle of deviation, and then I can recommend something like prisms or Botox or surgery based upon the uh, magnitude of that deviation. When patients come in, um, I'm not gonna bore you with this, but there could be problems in lots of different parts of the anatomy that the doctor has to figure out why you're having the double vision and misalignment. In terms of patients with chordomas, as Dr. Nautical said, this is the clivus, and right behind the clivus is your brainstem. I'm not gonna bore you with this, but the brainstem is a part of the brain that has these nerves, and they're numbered one through 12, okay? Number six comes out of something called the pons, and the pons sits right in front of the clivus, okay? And number six exits the pons, climbs up the clivus, and then goes anterior towards the eyeballs into something called Dorella's canal. When you have a chordoma, it can push on the sixth nerve, and it could push on the one on the left or the right. If that happens, you get something called a sixth nerve palsy. Palsy means weakness, okay? And I should have said, the sixth nerve, what it actually does is it causes you, or it gives you the ability for your eye to look towards your ear, okay? So the left eye to look towards my left ear, my right eye to look towards my right ear. So if, let's say, my right sixth nerve is affected, I can't look towards my ear and my eye will turn towards my nose. And then I'll see two images side by side, okay? And then this is just a graphic. These are the different one through 12 and kind of for lay people like what they do. And number six is the, uh, where is it? Six is over here, it's the eye movement. But basically if you're looking at a person, the left eye would be straight, the right eye would be turned in. When they try to look to the right, the left eye can turn towards the nose, but the right eye can't, okay? So that's a right six nerve palsy. That means your double vision will be worse when you look to the right. It's present when you look straight ahead, but it's relatively improved when you look to the left. That could be confusing to patients because they come in and tell their, their loved ones or the doctor, I, I don't know, sometimes I see double, sometimes I don't, it's confusing and, you know, and then doctors, who aren't trained in this can be confused about the correct diagnosis, okay? But that's why it can be confusing depending on where you look. And this is, let me see. Great. Um, double vision started probably about a week ago. Um, when it first started, I, if I concentrated hard enough, I could focus in to single vision. Um, but after probably two or three days, nothing, no matter how hard I concentrated, I. It was just split images, double vision constantly since okay. then. And if you close either eye, it went away? Yep, and if I close so it's binocular. Eyes, I can go back to single vision. Yep. And, and the and double right, vision the was... The right eye being the strongest, I generally wear a patch over the left eye now. Right. And the double vision was side by side or on top of it each other? It was side by side. Okay. And was it yeah. worse when you looked straight ahead or to the left or to the right? It's worse straight ahead. Okay. What about when you look to the right? Uh, it's not quite as bad, but everything's still in double vision. You're giving me the wrong answer. It should be much worse when you look to the right than the left. Look over here at my finger. So if you look, you his double? eyes can go over here. Barely double. All right, what about over here? His eye does not turn out towards his nose. Yeah, yeah, he can't get yeah, that's double. There. Okay, and then look at the camera. And so he wasn't really even aware that it's worse to the right and the left because okay. it's confusing. So, um, okay. can and then, you look to the right? So you see that the eye does not turn out. And look to the left? But the eyes move. And look at the camera. So it's a right six up. nerve palsy, okay? So that's kind of like what happens typically in chordoma patients, okay? Um, and now, how do you help patients with it, okay? Well, there's three, four different kind of, oh, oh God, sorry about that. Um, four different strategies, occlusion, prisms, Botox, and surgery. So let me just see, I just put this, yeah. So if it's binocular, right, and it's only present with both eyes open, if you cover one eye, it goes away. That's the simplest, most effective way to get rid of the double vision, okay? People don't like wearing this pirate patch, right? Um, sometimes we recommend something called transport tape, so you just put it over the glasses of one eye. It allows light in, but not enough that you can see through it, so it blocks the vision from one eye and you're just looking with the other. Gets rid of double vision. Not a great solution because depth perception is affected. It doesn't cosmetically look great and all those things, but it's really good if you're um, for temporary treatment, especially when you're waiting for surgery, okay? 
prisms. I just want to quickly not bore everyone with this, but um, basically a prism has a, a base and an apex, and when you shine light through it, it deflects the light, okay? And the thicker the base, the more it'll deflect the light so that you can create prism glasses. These are, are real. A patient of mine walked in and said uh, her optometrist gave these and it was causing blurred vision. And so you see how thick they can be depending. Most patients won't tolerate these because again, prisms, when you shine white light through them, it kind of it spreads the light into the rainbow. So it's kind of like if you shine Windex on a window and you look through, it's the rainbow. It, it can cloud the vision. So small prisms, patients will tolerate and they'll work well. But when they're large, they cause optical aberrations and patients do not tolerate them well. There's something called Fresnel. The S is silent. It's French. Um, it's a little stick-on, and it's these mini little uh, prisms that are built into this plastic lens that can go put, as you could put onto the front of your glasses. And again, these can work um, fairly well too, depending on how big the prism is. Um, although it can be a cosmetic issue. So this is the famous Hillary when she got grilled over Benghazi the first time in her green dress. And um, she was prescribed a prism and they gave her this Fresnel prism. And uh, ABC News was tracking me down. I was giving lectures in Nepal. And they're, they're like, can you explain what this is? And the right wing news groups were saying, were convinced it was because she had a brain tumor from like a nerve palsy. And that's what the cause of this was. Um, so it can um, cause cosmetic issues. So if you're going to testify in front of Congress, don't get a, don't get a Fresnel, OK? <laughs> So, and then let me just see here. And this is just the sense of when you look through the prism, those numbers are called prism diopters. The thicker the base, the stronger it is. And this is what happens. So if you look through the prism, it shifts that monitor over, okay? And then it has a, um, and this is a smaller prism. This is 10, 10 prism diopters. It'll shift it a little bit less. And then it has a, an orientation, so if you turn it, watch, we'll turn it like this, so then it'll shift the image up. And then if you, you'll see the, the image shifts up when you're looking through the prism. If you turn it the other way, it'll shift it to the side. So you need an optometrist or an optician or somebody who understands the orientation and the correct strength, okay? And then this is getting stronger, 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 and it shifts it more and more and more. Okay, so that's how they work. And in terms of when we apply them to a patient, if the eyes turned out, right, we see the double image. If we put a prism in front, it's going to bend the light. And in this case, it's not strong enough, but it gets the image closer. And then what we're going to do is put a stronger one in, and it bends the light more, and then you can see uh, a single image. Okay? Okay. And we talked about that. And then this was a fellow of mine many years ago. I used to keep these in my pocket. But this is what happens. They get kind of, these stick-on ones get grimy. So they're good for temporary treatment. They last two or three months, but they get really dirty. OK. The next thing we could do is Botox. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with how it actually works. But um, Botox, the first indication was in 1989. And strabismus, or misalignment of the eye, was the first FDA-approved indication for Botox. OK. And um, this is a patient of mine who had a bilateral six nerve palsy. So you can see she's looking straight ahead, and the right eye's turned towards her nose, the left eye's turned towards her nose. And the way Botox works is it weakens a muscle. So that if you have a six nerve palsy and the outer muscles are weak, the eyes turn in. But what happens is these inner muscles then tighten up. Right? So if you tie my arm like this, I'd say don't do that, no. But if you tie it like this and untie it, and I tried to then extend my arm, if it was like this for three months, my bicep would tighten up, right? It'd be really tough. So sometimes you can Botox, uh, sorry, um, the inner muscle to kind of allow the eyes to turn out. So sometimes it's a temporary treatment. I, one of my patient's mothers, I think, is here. Yep. And I saw her uh, daughter, and the conversation was, hey, can you Botox my daughter for six nerve palsy? And um, she was having already done with radiation therapy, and a lot of times the Botox is good if you're going through the radiation or chemotherapy, 
because Botox starts to work after one to three days. It has its maximal effect in about a week to 10 days, and it wears off after three to four months. So if you're going through radiation treatment and chemo and the eye's turned in, you can Botox it, the inner muscle, allow the eye to straighten while you're going through these other therapies. Those take about three or four months, and then you can do surgery about four to six months later. But if you do the Botox and then you're thinking about surgery, you really have to wait till it completely wears off before you do surgery. So it ultimately delays the surgery and it does wear off. So you have to do it every few months. So it's not a definitive treatment. It's good in certain indications for temporary uh, treatment, okay? And then this is a video. I'm told I can't show the end because it might be too graphic. So, but this is like in, in my office, we just do this. And then I'll fast, I'll fast forward it a little bit. to the right and what I'm going to do is take this Q-tip and I'm going to just slide it just down. numb the eye with the, the topical um, lidocaine or preparacaine. Gently pull this down. It feels a little bit weird at first. And if patients tolerate that, they'll tolerate the injection. It's a small needle that goes right in that location. And for time and things like that, and I don't want people to get grossed out, I'm not going to actually show it, but it's quick, it's easy, and patients tolerate it really well, okay? And so this is him. So you're back after the Botox injection. Yeah. So how did it, did it work? Did it not well? Okay. What did you notice afterwards? Uh, the first few weeks, maybe the first week actually, I didn't notice anything and then I just woke up. Because it takes a week to have its maximum effect. Great. Okay. Felt brand new. So the blurred vision and the eye strain and everything went away. It all clears up, okay? okay. Okay, so, and then after that, we have surgery. And um, just to very quickly, basic concepts. We operate on the muscles around the eye, so you can weaken a muscle, you can strengthen a muscle, or you can transpose it to change its, the, its force vector. And what we do is, these are the prism diopters, so you hold the prisms up in the office, you measure the deviation, and I translate the magnitude of that deviation to how much surgery we have to do, based on these tables. So very simply, if this patient had an eye that's higher up, what we could do is we could tighten this bottom muscle and we can loosen this upper muscle. And by loosening it, we just move it back. And by tightening it, we actually remove a section of it and reattach it. So you can lo loosen or weaken or strengthen muscles. So for six nerve palsies, if the eye's turned in, you weaken the inner muscle and tighten the outer muscle to pull it out. It's the basic concept of strabismus surgery. There's something called an adjustable suture which means that when a patient wakes up from surgery, if the eye's not aligned, I could put a numbing drop in and I can actually adjust the suture position, which changes the muscle position, which moves the eye in or out. So we can actually fine tune our surgery while the patient's awake. And then, um, so, so how are you doing since surgery five days ago? Good. How do the eyes feel? They feel good. You know, so within you a week, within a few days, patients are doing actually really well. Yeah. I operate on both of her eyes. And then again, to save time. Um, in this case, this is the patient. She's looking straight with this eye. This eye is up. And then after surgery, the eyes are aligned. Uh, this patient had bilateral six nerve palsies. You could see she had a, a turn of her face. She's trying to look to the right here. This right eye does not turn out. Here she's looking to the left. She has bilateral six nerve palsies. After surgery, her eyes are straight. The eyes still don't turn out great. It turns out more so we can improve things. We can't make them perfect often. And so the, con the conversation is often we can create a zone or area where things are single, but often there's still double vision to the sides, above and below, but we create a nice functional zone of, of single vision for most patients. Here's a patient, again, looking straight ahead. The eyes turn down. After surgery, the eyes are straight. Um, another patient of mine, and this is a few days after surgery, the eyes are red. It's not terrible, but it's red after surgery and that wears, that resolves after a couple of weeks. And then this is a patient of mine here, and then this is her. So before surgery and then after, okay. And then another one, and then again. So my conclusions are that double vision is very difficult um, to tolerate. Like this is really in, it's just terrible. And um, double vision is often seen in these clavicordomas causing these six nerve palsies, which causes a limitation of the eye to move towards the ear. 
And then there's a lot of good treatments, not perfect, but good treatments that include prisms, Botox, and surgery. So thank you. I think we're opening up to questions now. questions for both of you. Um, if you have a low growth hormone, will replacing it increase the likelihood that you're going to have a recurrence? Should I answer that? Uh, Just kidding. <laughs> so actually, I was actually sure that someone would ask me about growth hormone today. In fact, I have some slides that I hid, and the reason I hid them is because honestly, I don't know how safe it is. And I think it's a very individual kind of risk benefit equation to discuss. Um, so the, it's tricky to measure growth hormone. So those tests have to be done by an expert in dynamic testing. You can't just get a growth hormone level. It's, it's a very specialized test. If you're a kid and you need to grow, it's probably worth it. And they, they give kids that have like serious cancers once they're like treated enough growth hormone and they grow. And so that's kind of, you have to do that. In someone who's finished growing, you have to think about what the benefits are of giving back growth hormone and compare that with the risk that there is a possibility that tumor will grow on growth hormone. And when we think about the tumor risk, we're not just thinking about the chordoma. Because if in those, not that many people in this room have had radiation, but many people with chordomas have, and once you have had radiation, you actually have a lifetime slight, slight, tiny, tiny risk of getting another tumor at some point later, like a meningioma, and it's usually something benign. But do you want to be on growth hormone when you have that? You know, so, so there's a tiny risk of tumor coming back, either chordoma, and it's probably very small. And if you really are gonna benefit from growth hormone, it may be worth it. Growth hormone has been shown to be good for bones, to be good for heart, to be good, good for quality of life, body composition. In my own experience with adults receiving growth hormone, it's a very mixed situation where some patients are on growth hormone and they would pay so much for it to stay on it when their insurance says no and they just feel so much better on it. I have other patients that do not know why they are taking a shot every day because it doesn't help them at all or they get joint pain and swelling and it's useless. And it can be anything in between. In general, I think the younger you are, the more helpful and the less risky growth hormone is. And the older you are, the harder it is to take it and the, the fewer benefits you get from it. In normal aging, we all go down on our growth hormone and end up with lower levels. So. That is a very kind of simplistic answer. This decision is important to ask and to think through with your team. And my question regarding strabismus is uh, I've had proton radiation and I've had three gamma. Uh, do you have to wait? or can you have strabismus surgery during this period? I right. don't know if I need more. Right, um, so in general, we like to wait because if the chordoma is pushing on the sixth nerve and you do radiation to try to shrink the tumor, you might get some recovery of the function of the nerve. So we wanna really give that an opportunity to happen. And so usually we tend to wait about six months. Um, it's not an absolute contraindication, but in general, if you're getting treated for a tumor and we're hoping to shrink it, then, and if it's close or causing the sixth nerve palsy, we want to give that the, a, a chance to work. So we usually do wait. But if, if the, the follow-up question I think was, you've had a few treatments, you might need more in the future, you're not sure. If you still have the double vision, you can do the surgery, straighten the eyes, and then 
I always warn my patients, listen, we can straighten your eyes, but if the tumor grows back or you get you know, radiation, it could damage the sixth nerve and you could get recurrence of the double vision. And if that happens, we could then go back to either prisms or do more surgery in the future. So it's not like you just limited to do one surgery. Um, I think uh, I, I had a patient once flying from Arizona, not with a chordoma, but she had like 27 strabismus surgeries in a period of five years. It was, mm -hmm. so you can do, you know, I wouldn't recommend that, but the, you know, so people get or have sometimes two or three surgeries when they have um, active disease or disease that can kind of come back. And then the other thing is we didn't really talk about, we we're talking about the chordoma. Occasionally the radiation itself can cause damage. And I think that's a little confusing because I think a lot of patients think that the radiation damage, if it's gonna occur, occurs immediately while they're getting it. Mm -hmm. But it's actually um, the two peak time periods are six months and five years after receiving treatment. So sometimes you can have a patient who's had a chordoma, they get radiated and they're fine for years and there's no evidence of recurrence of their disease, but then they can develop a six nerve palsy. And it can be from radiation damage from the radiation years ago. Yeah. It's rare, but we see it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sestari, you mentioned that particular palsy. Are there palsy, um, sorry, over here. Who, who's, oh, sorry. <laughs> Are there palsies in um, other, um, impacting other nerves? Like so the, the cranium. Yep, so they can. So we've been, I, I mean, we know the chordomas have a predilection towards the lumbosacral spine and, and the clivus. So they can, extend superiorly, right? So the six, so the nerves, the cranial nerves are ordered um, numbered one through 12, and number one starts at the top and number 12 at the bottom. So the clivus is where the pond sits and that's like number five, six, and seven is kind of right around there. So if the tumor extends upwards, then you can affect three and four, especially if it goes upwards and anteriorly into something called the cavernous sinus. Um, so yes, you can get, Three, four, and six, those are the three nerves that are involved in movements of the eyes. And then five is like facial numbness, right? Seven is facial movement or animation. So yeah, we have, an, you know, chordoma patients who've got multiple cranial nerves that are involved. I just picked number six because that's the most common. And the, the patient I showed you um, did have some cranial nerve effects beyond just the vision. So if you remember her story, she went on to have difficulty swallowing, and that was probably because lower down, that's yeah. getting the nerve that's, that's responsible for that. And um, she also had some numbness, so that was the facial nerve. So she had a large tumor and a lot of cranial nerve palsies. That's why neurology needs to be involved as well as neuro-ophthalmology. Right. And again, sometimes it could be the tumor, sometimes it could be the effects of the surgical debulking, because the mm -hmm. surgeon has to get in there. And sometimes they have to push structures out of the way to gain access. And when they do that, sometimes it can cause injury to these nerves. And then sometimes, I mean, you had mentioned gamma knife versus proton beam. You know, um, there's different pros and cons to different forms of radiation. Um, but depending on the location of the tumor, different parts of the brain can be exposed to that radiation. And these cranial nerves can tolerate a certain amount um, and, and it could be fairly safe, whereas if, you, if the uh, neuro-oncologist, um, or radiation oncologist, depending on what the treatment plan is, depending on how many gray they're giving, and depending on what nerves are exposed, you can get other cranial nerves that are affected by the radiation as part of the treatment to, to get rid of the chordoma. Um, hi, hi there, um, I'm Joe here. <laughs> I have a question, um, a hormone question for my 15-year-old daughter. She's just received um, proton beam at the MGH. She's finished 38 sessions of radiation. She had an aggressive um, conventional chordoma, and um, but it's a recurrence, and um, she had radiation. I'm not sure if the pituitary gland has been impacted, but um, I just wanted to um, f um, get some opinion before we go home. If we were to consult an endocrinologist, 
Um, what do you recommend for someone like her, apart from the free T4 test? Um, she also had, she, she underwent chemotherapy where she had a needle to stop ovulation or stop um, ov um, period from happening during chemo. I just wanted to know um, what sort of test would she need to run on an annual basis? Or what, what do we need to look for? So um, after radiation, it, you kind of have to check everything out at about six months post radiation. Uh, ideally would have had some evaluation as baseline. And then at the six month mark, so you just finished. Congratulations. And so at about six months, I would find a local pituitary center where they really do this well, if you can, and um, see the neuroendocrine folks there. And there you can have your cortisol checked in either morning cortisol, and if that's not revealing enough, like do this special one hour test. It's, it's not harmful or painful or anything. It's just an hour. And then you can, you get like a little squirt to your adrenal to stimulate it. And at 60 minutes, that cortisol should get high. If it doesn't get high, it means maybe you'd benefit from some extra cortisol given to you. So that would be an important one to do. And then you would do that at six months and 12 months and 24 months and ongoing every year. In terms of um, the estrogen, that's a trickier question. Um, probably looking in once the effects of whatever shot they gave you, they might want to reevaluate that. See if your periods come back on your own, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then you might want to think about going on estrogen. Some of these tumors do make, uh, do have estrogen receptors and androgen receptors. You can probably get that information about your tumor if you want to ask your path to look at it. But most of the time in your age group, the benefits of estrogen are so much that we would recommend it. Um, once you're you know, cured and if the neuro-oncologists agree. Great. Um, so estrogen, cortisol, free T4 would all be reasonable. Sounds good. And okay. um, I feel like I'm getting some mixed reviews on growth hormone versus um, that it has no impact on the, on the growth of recurrence, so. Right, um, right. There's really no data to say that it does make a tumor recur. I usually like to start it after somebody's, if I'm going to do it, I would like to do it in someone like you who's super young because those are the people that have the most benefit just neurocognitively and everything else and you can tolerate higher doses because you don't already have arthritis hopefully the way that you do if you're treating an 80 year old. So you know it's, it has to be individualized, talk to your doctors, but there's no evidence that I'm aware of that shows that if you're going to give growth hormone, it's going to make a cordoma recur. I don't think there is any evidence of that. That being said, I usually, with, whether it's a benign pituitary tumor or a cordoma, I don't usually like to give growth hormone when somebody is still having active tumor growth because it just confuses the picture. So I'll usually wait a year or two until there's stability and then give the growth hormone. But you know, at a 15, that might be a little different. You might want to start a little earlier because you're still young. I don't know if you can still grow depending on how much estrogen your bones have already seen. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the other question I have, which is, She's 15 now, has she stopped growing and does she still need any more growth? Hormone? Yeah, so um, a bone age will tell you whether there could be any more growth. So once a bone age is at mature stage, no matter how much growth hormone we give you, you're not gonna grow. You might get other benefits from it, but you're not gonna grow. If your bone age is still below the kind of mature age, then you will get some growth out of it and then you wanna do that sooner rather than later, then that's worth it. But if you already, when a, I'm gonna just talk generally rather than at a specific case, but if somebody, if it's a kid or an adolescent woman who's already gone through puberty or male who's already gone through puberty, they're not gonna grow anymore. They've, they've seen the sex steroid. The sex steroid, which is the estrogen or testosterone, seals the bones. So the epiphyses are closed. You cannot make their skeletal grow longer. If you could, I would be on growth hormone. <laughs> um, and, and so as a result of that, there are still other benefits in an adolescent that should be considered, but you may want to wait a bit. If you're not going to grow anyway, like just give it a minute. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I have another question, if sure. that's okay. For, of course. Um, it's a, um, real, it's a um, sorry, the neuro-ophthalmology question. <laughs> well, luckily we have Dr. Sistari here. <laughs> yeah, you're the fabulous team here. Okay. Um, my daughter also had uh, a transcochlear surgery recently in March where the fifth and seventh cranial nerves have been compromised. And um, so meaning her right side of her facial nerves, it's damaged, they're damaged, and um, her, 
her right side of the face is paralyzed, affecting her eye, not being able to feel anything, you know, of, uh, foreign ob objects flying in, and, and also her eyelid couldn't close fully. So my question is, is a lateral tassography uh, better or a weight in the eyelid better to help with closure of the eye to protect any future corneal um, ulcer from happening? Right. <clears throat> Where are you guys from? Australia. Okay, got it. Uh, Sydney? Uh, Brisbane. Brisbane, got it, okay. I took a semester in Australia. I, I love it over there, but I have colleagues in Sydney. That's why I was asking. Um, so just to go through the anatomy, um, so sensation is cranial nerve five, right? And facial movement is seven. Um, so that includes the smile, closing the eye, and raising the eyebrow, okay? So um, if it's fully affected, then she, you can't close the eye well, and we have to blink to um, bathe our cornea. So the cornea is the clear part of the eye, and blinking, we're constantly blinking to, to refresh it, okay? And if you're not able to blink, then it dries out, and then you can get uh, a corneal ulcer. So just to put it in context for everybody. So there's different ways to help with this. So one, at Mass Eye Near, there's the facial reanimation group. Have you spoken? Yeah, yeah. I've met with um, Dr. Hadlock. Hadlock, yeah, Tessa. So she's fantastic. So that's one, in a severe case, I think that is very helpful. And then in terms of, I think, what you're asking about is a gold or lead weight in the eyelid versus a lateral tarsorophy. So a tarsorophy means that you take the upper and lower lids and you suture them together, okay, the lateral side, so that it's easier to kind of blink, so that if there is some movement. Um, and by them being sewn together, uh, it's covering the cornea so it's less likely to dry out, right? Um, Whereas a, a gold or lead uh, weight in the upper eyelid, if you're blinking a little bit, it helps it because it's heavier to close. So it depends on how much function is left. So it depends on the specific examination details. Sometimes a gold weight would be preferable because it's more natural. So if, you, if there's some function and you could put a weight in and blink, I think that would be from a cosmetic point of view and a functional point of view. But if there's really no movement, then the lateral tarsorophy is a more extreme, and so then, you know, the so. The weight is probably more ideal, I guess, I, from a cosmetic point of view as well. Yeah, I, I, yes. Great. They Thank each you. have their pros and cons, but if there is some movement, then I would prefer a gold weight. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you very much. Sure. I'm gonna ask a really stupid question. If you do the surgery, does that mean you can't open the eye if you do the full, if you suture together? No, because they kind of balance it. Um, even with, after the surgery, you can still open yes, it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a 23-year-old uh, <clears throat> son, seven years post-surgery and radiation here. You've answered the question on growth hormone beautifully. My question is, with respect to other hormone therapy that he might need, pituitary, hypothalamus, uh, thyroid. In your experience, have you seen any reoccurrence due to any other hormone therapy? So uh, the question, and I just want to also ask, did your son go through radiation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with Dr. Lynch. Oh, nice. So, um, so the answer is I am not aware of any recurrences due to hormone replacement for any of the hormones, and that includes growth hormone. But growth hormone has its own risks in terms of tumor progression if you have any cancer besides the chordoma. And any cancer in general is contraindicated to give growth hormone. That is not true for any of the other hormones. All of the other hormones are safe and not causing any tumors. So thyroid, cortisol. Now the one question is testosterone. So testosterone is a tricky one. If you're a young male, you should definitely be on testosterone, or if you're a young male who wants fertility, you should be on HCG, um, to, because if you're on testosterone, it will bring back all the sex steroid that you need to make you look and feel normal, but it will not allow fertility. And so if you want fertility, you want HCG, which does all the same things, 
but also can stimulate spermatogenesis instead of stopping it. Mm. So that is kind of the way you think about it. But then what about testosterone and its risk of tumors? I, it will not cause a recurrence of chordoma in my mind, and I have men that have had chordomas or chondrosarcomas who have had radiation and are on testosterone for years and years and years. I have not seen them recur. So like once they're cured and they're good, they're good. And I put them on testosterone. But I have seen, I wish there was more literature on this. I saw one paper um, on the pathology of chordomas. And they do have androgen receptors. And testosterone is an androgen. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't it make them grow? I can't answer that question. And there's only like one paper on it which I don't understand like why we don't have more information about this. But I'd say in clinical practice, I've never put someone on testosterone and seen their chordoma grow. So I think it's safe. And the benefits are there. Like you need testosterone for bone health. You need it if you're a young person. Like, so I think in most cases, testosterone would not be a problem. The other ones, cortisol and thyroid, would 100% not be a problem. The only thing about testosterone is that it can cause some clotting in someone who's prone to that. It has a slight increased risk of clots if you have a problem with clots. And if you don't, I think it's safe, just needs to be monitored, especially if there's a risk of any prostate problem. Oh, you did? Oh, congratulations. You were in my office. Okay. Dr. Dictal. Oh, she wasn't there yesterday. I think I was the only one there covering for seven people on maternity leave. <laughs> My husband had the clival chordoma removed almost two years ago in October. And when we left uh, the hospital, um, I'm a nurse and I'm very into some of the rehabs and therapies. And I asked about ocular therapy, seeing an OT. And um, the nurse practitioner said, it's not really recommended, it's not going to help. And then I asked his doctor and he said, I'll write you a prescription for it. He said, I, I really don't know that it's going to do anything, but go for it. So he did go, I don't really know how many months, maybe about five months, he did go. Now, I don't mind being wrong about this because I learn when I'm wrong, but um, all of a sudden, in May, six months later, we were driving and he didn't have his patch on or his occluded glass you know, prism, or it wasn't a prism, I actually just put contact paper inside each lens of each set of eyeglasses and he didn't have his glasses on and he said, I could see. Mm. So it just happened like that, like a yeah. light switch. So the, only, I, the therapist was able to measure slight improvements mm -hmm. along the way, and yep. he did his exercises. He was so diligent about yep. it. But do you feel as though you would recommend that for your patients? Right. And so um, congratulations. That's fantastic. And when you say vision, you mean double vision? Yeah. Yeah, got it. So <clears throat> um, this question comes up all the time or often. and. Um, it's a little tricky, okay, because from the point of view that um, I think physical therapy and occupational therapy is really important, especially in some people because the, one of the worst parts of the cancer is like losing control, right? And all these doctors telling you what to do and you feel like you've lost control. And when you're actually doing physical therapy or rehab, you feel like you're working towards getting better, right? And there's a kind of like a psychological benefit to that, okay? So I think from that point of view, for certain people, it's really important. In terms of it having an effect, um, the issue is that it's a nerve that's injured. So it's not really like a muscle that you're rehabbing. And so the rehab exercises per se, the studies that I understand them, it, it's not that they are making the nerve work better. And so usually what it is though, it's time. So if you have treatment and there's a nerve that's injured, when you then alleviate the pressure on that nerve and you give it time, the nerve can recover. Now, if I, but I'm not gonna try to convince you because it, six months later, it got better. Like would it have gotten better on its own without the therapy, right, that kind of thing. So. I think, I always tell my patients, if it's covered by insurance and you can do it and you wanna do it, then do it. Sometimes I have issues with some of my patients that come in 
and their insurances won't cover it, and then there are these, um, and I'm not trying to disparage any profession here, but there are kind of neuro-optometrists that kind of have these um, rehab programs. They're not covered by insurance. You have to pay out of pocket for them, and you do this light therapy and things like that, and sometimes patients can be really desperate for improvement, and they try these therapies, and they pay out of pocket for them. So, um, you know, the data is really that the recovery is usually going to be time, um, and if, if it's covered and it made you feel better, then I think it's great, and I, I, I can't be 100% sure that it wasn't that, but in general, the therapy for nerve injuries like that, it, 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 our understanding is that it doesn't have a huge impact. Okay, so he was right. <laughs> I, I don't know. He's in health. He's in healthcare too, so he made his own decision. But he did yeah, what I wanted. I, you know, I, I just, you know, listen. I sprained my ankle. I went to rehab, and like, you know, it certainly helped. But you know, and it, you can rehab sprains and muscle tears and things like that. But when it comes to like nerves being pressed, you know, that if you take two groups and they don't do rehab and they do, the outcomes are generally the same. But patients who went to rehab or like they feel like they're contributing to their improvement and I think that's a great thing right so healing is holistic right and, and doctors should be open-minded to that and a lot of our patients come in so as long as it's not harmful right and as long as like we have patients that are like I'm flying to whatever country and I'm gonna get stem cell you know injections for this that and magnetic treatments and they're charging me twenty thousand dollars and that's when I have an issue with it um, because it can be a slippery slope when people are really, um, I don't want to use the word desperate, but you're vulnerable and you want help. And then somebody, you come to me and say, ah, it's not going to work, but you go to somebody else, oh yeah, it's going to work and this and that. So you always have to be careful of who's giving you the advice and, and if they have um, an ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people who profit from these things might be biased because they have a financial incentive. And I'm not saying they do, you know, I'm just saying, you know, just be careful because sometimes it can, there can be a bias there. So if, if the rehab helped you and six months later it worked, then I think that's great. It's probably then a combination of time and the rehab. I think the rehab was just something that measured yeah. um, the incremental yeah. improvement that was just happening anyway, but yeah. he did appease me, so. Yeah. <laughs> A happy wife is a happy life. <laughs> My wife reminds me of that every day. <laughs> um, I just had a question for Dr. Satari. Um, I also have struggled with double vision, um, I believe fourth and sixth nerve palsy, um, and I was prescribed uh, Oxervate. Do you have any experience with that? And it is that kind of direction to go. Um, I was using it for a few days, but my eye just blew up red, uh, uh, uncomfortable. What was um, the medicine? Uh, Oxervate. I never heard, well, never heard of it. Can you spell okay. it? Is that the generic uh, or that's the trade name? I think that's the trade name. Uh, Senna German. I'm terrible Can you spell it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Oxervate is O-X-E-R-V-A-T-E. Um, and then in parentheses, it's C-E-N-E-G-E-R-M-I-N. -E -E um, it was prescribed to me originally, someone from the NIH um, recommended it, um, and I believe it's supposed to help with um, uh, neurotrophic keratitis. Um, I, I had ripped my cornea, mm. um, but since then, like, I still have uh, numbness on this whole side of my face, mm -hmm. uh, slight, uh, double vision, and mm. then I can't cry from mm. my left eye, so it's it's very dry. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering the best route, um, and if I'm currently in radiation, uh, if taking Oxervate while going through radiation is okay to do. Sure. Um, I've just, do you, is, do you have it there? Did I'm you, looking it yeah. up. It's an eye drop that's approved for dry eyes, so I think it's a uh, moisturizing thing. Okay. So it's one of the... So there's been a few that have been approved recently for dry eyes, so it's probably to help lubricate the cornea. So if that's what it is, it, it should be fine, but I I've, have no experience with it, okay. so I would defer that to like a Apparently cornea Apparently it's doctor. approved for neurotrophic keratitis. keratitis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What does that translate to? So neurotrophic keratitis means that, um, so 
our, you know, pain, it's an interesting thing, right? So if you, if you put your hand in, in fire, you pull back, right? So pain protects us from danger, right? Um, and the cornea has pain um, fibers. And so if you get something in your eye, you're gonna close and you're, you're gonna get away from it. Um, but when you have um, um, uh, injury to the fifth cranial nerve, you have no sensation. And so you're not blinking as much. So you get a keratitis. The kera part refers to the cornea and itis is the inflammation. So you get inflammation of the cornea and it can be thickened and then it, it can cause some blurry vision. Um, and a lot of times this is getting worse because as, as, as the group from Australia was saying, if you're not blinking and lubricating it, the cornea really kind of dries out and can get become vulnerable to infections and things like that. So uh, lubricating it really helps to avoid those problems and avoid infections. Now maybe this does something um, specifically for the... This is the active ingredient. Yeah. I don't know what that is. It's, an, it's a, like a very strong lubricant, I think. Senate German. Yeah. yeah, I apologize. It's not it is FDA approved for yeah. for that purpose, but they had mentioned like it helped with nerve growth or something, yeah. and so I wasn't. Um, I'm mostly trying to figure out how I can get feeling back in this side of yeah, my face. Yeah, no, I totally yeah. understand. Um, so the tricky part is the trigeminal nerve, which is starts all the way back in the brainstem and then kind of goes up to the cornea. Right, so the chordoma is damaging or injuring the um, trigeminal nerve back in the brain, and that's kind of probably why the cornea then gets affected. But I, I just don't know anything about that drop, so I don't, I don't want to comment. If it's FDA approved and your doctor prescribed it, I would defer to him or her about really the benefits of it. I don't want to say anything wrong, yeah, no. but if it's approved, that means it went through a study and there's benefit to it. Yeah, Thank I'm sorry, I don't know about it. Yeah. Right. Thank you guys so much. We have now reached the end of session one for our breakout um, sessions for this afternoon. If you did have another question or a question that was not able to be answered today, please just let me know. Um, I'll give you my email address and we can get in contact with them um, afterwards to get some answers. Um, special thank you to Dr. Sistari and Dr. Najagal for all of the information that you shared today. Very helpful. Um, next up, we will have, you have the opportunity to choose from three different sessions. In this room will be a session about dealing with pain. Um, in Salon 2 will be about nutrition and cancer, and in Salon uh, 1 will be about advocating for your care, things that you can do, ways that you can, um, tips and stuff like that that you can learn about to help you advocate as you move through this journey.